there's two, really two parts of this debate. There's the evidential argument about what best explains the information in DNA inside the cell. And then there's the, the a second part of the debate, which is, um, a, a, is intelligent design scientific? And having had to concede that there is not an adequate, undirected, materialistic process that can explain the origin of the information needed to produce the first life. What critics of intelligent design typically do, in other words, they don't have a better explanation to offer. What they do is they try to discredit the explanation that I'm offering and say, well, the, the, uh, the design hypothesis for the origin of information is simply not a scientific hypothesis. And in order to try to discredit intelligent design, then what people will do is typically erect some definition of science and use that to disqualify intelligent design and say that intelligent design is not scientific by definition. It's inherently unscientific. It can't be science. And then they'll offer some definition. And sometimes they'll say, well, it's not scientific because scientific theories must in can't invoke unobservable entities. And the designing intelligence in the remote uh, history of life would be an unobservable entity. It, they would sometimes say that intelligent design is not scientific because it's not testable. Or they would say intelligent design is not scientific because all scientific theories have to make predictions and intelligent design doesn't make predictions, or on and on. So there's the, any number of criteria that are offered of true scientific status, and then those criteria are used to disqualify intelligent design. Now, um, I got really interested in these arguments when I was first coming out of graduate school, because I'd come out of the field of history and philosophy of science. And most science, uh, philosophers of science will tell you that, that the whole problem of defining science is notoriously difficult. And one of the reasons it's difficult is that different types of science have used different methods. And typically these definitions of science that are used to disqualify theories we don't like are, are, are definitions that are based on, on some understanding of scientific method. Usually people will say the scientific method. But in fact there are many different scientific methods and that's where they typically run into trouble. But I discovered something interesting about these, these demarcation arguments as they're called. The demarcation is the idea of separating uh, science from non-science. And, and what I discovered was if you use a definition of science to disqualify intelligent design, if you define science a certain way, if you use that same definition, you can just as easily disqualify the competing evolutionary ideas for the origin of life or the origin of new form or whatever it is. That these ideas have an equiv or these, these arguments ha or criteria have a kind of equivalence. If you, would, if you apply them in a really strict and rigid way, they, yeah, they can be used to disqualify intelligent design, but they cut just as much the other direction, against the grain, against the competing ideas that are usually trying to be, uh, that the critics are trying to protect by using these arguments. So let me give you an example. Uh, one, uh, 1993, when Dean Kenyon was uh, uh, in, in trouble at San Francisco State University for discussing intelligent design in one of his biology classes, some of his critics said, well, intelligent design isn't scientific because the designer is unobservable. You can't see or measure the, des the, the, the designer. And, and uh, but uh, this is not a kind of argument to make for anyone who's aware of, for example, theoretical physics or evolutionary biology or molecular biology or any number of fields. In science, we very often uh, infer an unobservable entity as the explanation for facts and evidence that we can observe. So science is often indirectly inferential. You infer from the observable to the unobservable. That's exactly what the theory of intelligent design does. We infer, infer from the observable facts of molecular biology to the unobservable action of a designing intelligence. Evolutionary biology does the same thing. It infers to unobservable past events and, and, and processes. So if unobservables are legitimate in some branches of science, then why can't they be legitimate in intelligent design? Or conversely, if you're going to disqualify intelligent design on the basis uh, th that it infers an unobservable entity, then, then on the same basis you ought to disqualify the competing theories or other scientific theories that invoke unobservable realities to explain observable phenomena. So there's this kind of equivalence. And what I found is that that equivalence holds no matter what the criterion of method that's being asserted as necessary to scientific status is. No matter what, what definition you use, you, you find the same, this, the, this same equivalency. Uh, between intelligent design and, and the theories that compete against it. If one set of theories is considered to be scientific by, by reference to a given definition, the other set of theories will be scientific as well. If the, if the definition is applied more narrowly, then you'll end up disqualifying intelligent design, but also its competitors. So 
you have the, the, this equivalency. The only ex exception to that is when you put forward a, a, a criterion of scientific standing or scientific status that is question begging, that is essentially loads the, the dice. So in the, in the, in ju what Judge Jones does is, is he said, um, intelligent design isn't scientific because it violates the principle of methodological naturalism and all scientific theories have to respect the principle of methodological naturalism. Well, what is the principle of methodological naturalism? It's the idea that you can't invoke creative intelligence in any of your theories. So intelligent design is not scientific because it invokes methodological naturalism. Why, why is methodological naturalism normative? Well, because it says that, that you can't invoke creative intelligence. Why not? Well, because that would be unscientific. It's all very circular in the end. And it's just another way of, what he did is, he reasserted a prohibition against intelligent design as an, as uh, under another name, and then treated that name as if it was a justification for that prohibition, when in fact it was just renaming the original prohibition. So it was an entirely circular and, and question-begging uh, definition of science that he used. So uh, these definitional arguments, as far as I'm concerned, just don't work, and they don't do the work that, that uh, protectors of orthodox materialistic evolutionary theories want them to do, and they don't disqualify intelligent design unless they disqualify all the competing theories as well, in which case then, all right, call it something different. Then call them metaphysical theories about the origin of life. Call them historical scientific theories with the met metaphysical implications. My point is it really doesn't matter in the end what you call these theories. What matters is whether or not they're true and which of them provides the best explanation based on what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. And that's where I think the theory of intelligent design has the competitors beat hands down. Based on the evidence, it provides the best explanation.